You have been criticized for praising Saudi Arabia and the Arab states, the Muslim governments, when the reality is that they have done very little for Gaza and many believe they are actually serving America and Israel. How do you respond to that? Well, first of all, the only thing that I have done is to try relatively consistently uh, to debunk lies about the Arab and the Muslim states that have been spread on social media, usually originating from Zionist sources. So no, I've simply told the truth. That's different from praise. I haven't praised them. If I'm supposed to just accept false information, disinformation as true, uh, in order to satisfy the need of some people to hate the Muslim governments, uh, I think that they should reflect uh, on the fact that they have to create a false narrative about those countries in order to justify their hatred. It's not rational to hate someone on the basis of the lies that you invent against them. I mean, if there are sufficient true things that are hate-worthy about someone, okay. But you're just making stuff up. It's the ultimate straw man. You're saying that the Arab countries uh, have done this and that and the other, and you hate them for those things, but all of those things that you're saying are not true. So you just hate them because you hate them. Because you have uh, emotional issues or something. Daddy issues, I don't know. But it's absolutely predictable that every time a story goes viral on X or wherever else uh, about some allegedly heinous, treacherous thing that the Arab countries have done, it's completely fabricated. And again, usually coming from Zionist media but being spread like small-town gossip uh, by Muslims on the internet, acting like somebody's old miserable auntie. It's predictable. It's the same every time. And all of this reveals to me a very deep, deep uh, psychological colonization, the slave mentality of so many Muslims in the West. I think they need to believe that the Muslim world is corrupt and that the leaders are uh, un-Islamic because they need to justify to themselves why they're in the West to begin with. They don't actually believe in or want a multipolar world. They don't actually want uh, the master's house to catch fire because they live in it. You know, it's like you were in a little dinghy in the sea, you know, for, for immigrants and, and the children of immigrants. They were in a little dinghy. And that's the so-called third world or the developing country that they came from. And they were able to jump uh, on board this big, beautiful ship when they made it to the United States. But it turns out that they jumped onto the Titanic. And they want to believe somehow that this big sinking ship is somehow still going to make it to the shore. But it isn't. And it won't. You jumped onto a sinking ship and you would have been better off staying in your dinghy. So you're on the deck of the Titanic deriding and making fun of uh, those little rowboats that aren't sinking. And you refuse to believe that you're going under. Let me tell you, when you allow yourself to believe the American narrative, the American a version of the world and of current affairs, then you have allowed yourself to disconnect from reality and to live in a, a, a hallucination. Because no version of reality being presented by the Americans or by the Israelis bears any resemblance to the real world. They're absolutely delusional. So take Saudi Arabia. The American and the Israeli narrative is that the Saudis are desperate to ingratiate themselves with Washington and with Tel Aviv. You know, that the, that the, the Saudis are desperately trying to find some kind of a way to make America love them. And the main thing that they want to do to achieve that uh, is to normalize with Israel. Well, this is just like Fiona Harvey saying that Richard Gadd was obsessed with her. Meanwhile, America is sending Saudi Arabia drunk I miss you texts at 3 o'clock in the morning saying we should hang out together again. Look, uh, the Saudis, the Arab League, the OIC, and BRICS have all taken a single, unified, inflexible stance on Gaza, on Palestine. And it's in conformity with the Arab Peace Initiative of uh, 2002. Saudi has not changed their position in over 20 years. This is the position that bin Salman took in negotiations with the U.S. on normalization with Israel before October 7th. And it's the same position that he repeatedly reiterates now. It's the same position that was articulated at the Arab Islamic uh, Summit last year. And nothing has changed. This is why when the Americans uh, wanted to include normalization in their defense pact deal with the Saudis, they had to demure. Because the Saudis said, okay, sure, we can include that. We can talk about that. But that will mean the establishment of a Palestinian state along the 19th 
67, the June 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as the capital, an end to settlements, uh, a dismantling of all obstacles and divisions between the West Bank and Gaza, and uh, United Nations and American recognition of the state of Palestine. So the U.S. decided that they can go ahead maybe and make that defense pact with Saudi Arabia without normalization as a condition. Because at the end of the day, uh, Saudi Arabia has enormous influence as America's number one arms purchaser. And Raytheon and Boeing and all of those uh, weapons companies want to sell their weapons to Saudi Arabia. And bin Salman made it very clear in his Fox News interview that Saudi Arabia can easily shift to purchasing weapons from elsewhere, from China or Russia or Turkey or wherever. In fact, they're on track to building a domestic weapons sector that will, uh, in just a few years, make them self-sufficient with regards to weapons. They're mostly buying those weapons as a tactic for buying influence, and it's working. Listen, Saudi Arabia fought against the Houthis uh, in Yemen for years and years, as we all know. At the request, I might add, of the, uh, the then government of Yemen, they fought since uh, 2015. But when did they start serious negotiations with the Houthis and draw down hostilities? When did that happen? Well, it's, it, it happened when the Houthis started attacking Israeli-linked vessels in the Red Sea. They refused to participate in America's so-called coalition against the Houthis, and they even discouraged the United States from using military force against the Houthis. The Houthis themselves have said that their operations in the Red Sea don't even come up in their peace negotiations with Saudi Arabia. At a time when the U.S. Uh, urgently wanted, urgently needed, uh, Arab allyship, when they needed their Arab and Gulf allies to, to, to tow the American line over Israel, what did they do? Saudi Arabia joined BRICS, the UAE joined BRICS, Egypt joined BRICS, and Iran joined BRICS after first uh, establishing rapprochement with Saudi Arabia. Shortly after October 7th, I don't know if you remember, Netanyahu was asking Washington uh, to pressure Egypt into absorbing Palestinians from Gaza into Sinai. And they tried. That was the plan. Washington tried to convince uh, Sisi to go along with it, but he flatly refused. But how do you think he had the backbone to refuse? Because the GCC, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE are Sisi's paymasters. They could have told him to accept Netanyahu's uh, uh, and uh, Joe Biden's demands. I mean, if they're supposedly Western uh, Zionist puppets, that's what they would have done. But no. Instead, Egypt uh, told Washington and told Israel that expulsion of the Palestinians would nullify Camp David. And Jordan told them the same thing. And they did that only uh, with backing from the GCC. I mean, the UAE was the first country to put forward a ceasefire resolution at the UN. Do you remember that? The first one that America uh, vetoed. Earlier this month, the UAE announced that they wouldn't uh, allow uh, U.S. warplanes and drones that were based in Abu Dhabi, they won't allow them to, con to conduct strikes against Yemen and against Iraq. So they were forced to relocate all of those uh, warplanes and all of those drones. I really don't know what news people are following, you know, except that, like I said, they're just, uh, they're doing nothing but uh, consume American and Zionist delusional narratives without any scrutiny. The whole region has been turning away from the West for years now, for years, and gaining sovereignty and gaining independence little by little, bolstered by their deepening relations with China and Russia and with the BRICS nations. If you don't know this, you've really not been paying attention. Honestly, Americans, including American Muslims, are generally just as misinformed as someone back in the days of the Soviet Union who only read Pravda and only knew what the Kremlin told them. I mean, look at the Arab and Islamic Summit back in uh, uh, November 2023. Look at what they called for and look where we are now. They called for uh, both an ICJ and an ICC case against Israel. Well, both of those things are happening now with the active support of the Arab League and the OIC. They call for uh, an arms embargo against Israel. Well, Belgium, Italy, Spain, Canada, the Netherlands, Japan, They've all stopped sending weapons to Israel since then. The United Nations and the uh, EU have both discouraged weapon sales to Israel now. Even Joe Biden uh, suspended shipments to Israel this month of weapons. Of course, they also called for a, a UN-mandated ceasefire, and that was passed in Ramadan. Ceasefire and hostage negotiations are being carried out by who? By Qatar and by Egypt. You know, Israel floated the idea of the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and a few others establishing a civilian administration over Gaza after the war. 
And they, were, they, they all shot it down. They all shot down that suggestion. Every alternative suggestion that the Americans or the Israelis bring to the table hits a stone wall. The Arab Peace Initiative. Palestinian statehood, 67 borders, PLO government, Jerusalem the capital. No one's negotiating with you anymore. In fact, when they talk about uh, negotiating Saudi normalization with Israel, all that means is that the Saudis are negotiating Palestinian statehood. That's all that means. It means the Saudis are negotiating for the establishment of a Palestinian state because they have made it abundantly clear time and time again that this is the prerequisite to normalization. So if you want to talk about normalization, that talk is going to be about establishing a Palestinian state, pure and simple. We're not bargaining with you anymore because we don't have to. We don't have to bargain with you anymore. The price is fixed. The whole market has one price now. And no one has to compromise. I don't think people are understanding the concept of uh, economic diplomacy. The economic diplomacy that the Gulf has been practicing for years. The Gulf countries have an enormous amount of money. In their combined sovereign wealth funds, they have an enormous amount of money. And they've been using that money very strategically for a long time now. You think they've just been buying Lamborghinis? With those strategic investments... They've bought tremendous amounts of influence globally and a great deal of independence regionally. Look at the countries that have, uh, ha have said uh, today that they will recognize a Palestinian state, Palestinian statehood, Ireland, Nor uh, Norway, and Spain. Well, Saudi Arabia and the GCC have billions of dollars in investments in those countries. You know, Saudi Arabia just hosted an Arab European meeting last month to discuss the recognition of Palestinian statehood. Everyone, of course, understands that that meeting was a de facto meeting to get GCC investment into Europe. They're using their money uh, to line up support for the Arab Peace Initiative, for Palestinian statehood, for what the OIC and the Arab League, uh, what they called for at that summit. There are very few things that came out of that meeting in November that have not either happened, are happening, or are in the process of happening. That's a fact. You can look at it. You can look at that, their statement back in November. I mean, you can be uh, as dismissive as you want to be. If you want to be like the Americans and like the Zionists who want to continue to pretend uh, that they're still running the show and that the Arabs and the Muslims will just do as they're told, you can believe all of that if you like, but at your own risk. You can nurse your own emotional need to hate the Muslim rulers and to believe that the Muslims and the Arabs can never amount to anything, you know, Nurse your need to believe that America is the almighty of the world and everyone just kowtows to them and to the Israelis. But it gets clearer and clearer every day that that is nothing but a sickness in your own heart and in your own mind. A sickness of mental colonization. And I'm telling you, it's only because of people like you uh, who hold on to obsolete, out of touch, delusional, antiquated perceptions about American power and influence. It's only through people like you uh, that the Americans and the Zionists can continue to project any semblance of influence in the world, any semblance of power, because people like you keep propagating these false narratives. It's like people who actually believe Steven Seagal is an action hero or something. Today, honestly, not to mention the fact that the Arabs and the Muslim countries have provided more humanitarian aid than anyone else. Thousands of tons of aid, hundreds of millions of dollars in relief. You know, Qatar is the only reason that Hamas could function during uh, all those years of blockade in Gaza. They funded their administration all that time. Qatar did that, not Iran. Hamas, Fatah, and uh, even Hezbollah have had talks with Saudi Arabia in Riyadh, in Moscow, in Beijing. BRICS is running this situation from start to finish. The Gulf countries and BRICS, uh, the BRICS nations, are running circles around the Americans, around the Israelis. And like I said, they're lining up support for their position. They're encircling Washington. They're encircling Tel Aviv. And if you can't see it, uh, then you're just a typical Westerner. An indoctrinated, propagandized, uninformed, out-of-touch Westerner. I mean, you know that people will accuse you of being paid by the Gulf states for saying these things. I mean, that's just another example, really of Western delusional thinking, of not understanding the world as it actually is. I'm not saying anything but facts. True, actual, publicly available information. 
Meanwhile, they're lying. So who, who's paying them to lie? Because that's how it actually works. You don't pay people to tell the truth. You pay people uh, to fabricate fake stories and run smear campaigns. And that's all we've been seeing about the Arabs and about the, the, the Muslim rulers. Debunked story after debunked story. Because all the Zionists have left is propaganda. That's all they have left uh, is to try to misrepresent reality, to start rumors, to spread lies and black PR. We have to pay people to do that. You don't have to pay people to tell the truth. Look, I'm banned from the GCC. I worked for 10 years for an organization that was dedicated to exposing injustice in the UAE and in the Gulf. They've tried to hack my devices multiple times. So many times, I can't even keep track. They don't like me at all. You know, all of the slanderous stories about me on the internet originate from them, from the UAE, from stories that they published in their state media uh, and in smear campaigns that they ran because of my work on the Sheikh Al-Latifa case. You know, I was writing actively in support of the anti-coup, anti-Sisi uh, opposition movements in Egypt to the point that they called me uh, a shaitan on their state-run media. None of these countries like me. It doesn't matter if what I'm saying is uh, positive or negative about them, to be honest. That's what you have to understand. The Gulf countries do not accept for anyone outside of government to talk about politics. They're deeply suspicious and they're, they're hostile to anyone who commentates on political, uh, political affairs if they're not a member of the government. It doesn't matter if you're pro or against, as far as they're concerned. If you like what they're doing or you don't like what they're doing, you're not supposed to have an opinion on politics if you're not in the government. That's the way they see it. And ultimately, they don't even care uh, slightly, not even a little bit, about what anybody thinks about their political policies. If you're not a citizen of their countries, they don't care what you think. They only, uh, they only care about domestic opinion with uh, regard to their policies. They only spend uh, money on PR, putting out a positive image uh, for investors and tourists. They don't care one bit what people outside of their countries think about them politically. They're not going to pay someone uh, to correct false narratives about their political policies because they don't care what anyone thinks in that regard. They, they couldn't care less. Personally, I, I think that's a mistake on their part. But that's how it is. That's how they think. And they're certainly not going to pay someone with a criminal record, an ex-convict, to do positive PR for them. Someone who they themselves have maligned and slandered for 10 years. See, again, this has to do with a very different, uh, very different way of thinking between the West and the Arab and the Muslim world. The West is obsessed with image and with narrative. They're concerned and they're concentrated on reality. So when they spend their money, they spend it for tangible influence, like the tens of millions of dollars that they spend on political lobbying in Washington, the billions of dollars that they spend purchasing weapons and the billions of dollars that they spend on investment and economic diplomacy. Buying football teams, football clubs, hosting events, and what have you. They're not spending their money on YouTubers, paying for tweets. Americans do that. Zionists do that. That's their sort of thing. Because again, that's the only thing that they have left to do. They exist in a, in a, a virtual reality of their own making, because actual reality is not going in their favor anymore. See, I could say all sorts of negative things about the Gulf, about the Arab world, about the Arab countries. I know a lot. I've experienced a lot. And I've been involved in many, many cases through my work. But I'm not here to satisfy the sick emotional needs of psychologically colonized Muslims. To feed their appetite for misery and pessimism and su adhan. And I'm not going to cooperate uh, with the campaign to redirect Muslim anger away uh, from the real perpetrators of the genocide in Gaza towards the countries that are right now coordinating the uh, solution to that catastrophe. There are factions in the West whose only hope uh, is to undermine BRICS, to sow discord in the Muslim world, and to try to incite the Muslims against their own governments, to try to make them lose the plot. No. The only feet that have to be held to the fire right now are in the West. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the believers fight as though they are one single solid structure, united with unflinching solidarity and unity. And that's what the Muslim countries are doing. And that's what every single one of us should be doing. We should act that same way. Because we're in a fight. 
So I don't tolerate anyone uh, spreading misinformation and disinformation and lies and propaganda to discourage the Muslims, to dishearten the Muslims, and to deflect uh, the Muslims from the violent colonizing kuffar of the West. I don't tolerate it and neither should you. I mean, look at them. They're funding, arming, defending, simultaneously denying and justifying a savage genocide. They're violating all of the laws that they wrote themselves, and they're threatening anyone who wants those laws to be followed. Their own youth are turning against them, and in response, they're turning against their own youth. But you want to help them, distract from them, divert from them, by turning on the Muslim governments, the Muslim states, the Muslim leaders, the Arab leaders. And the only way you can do that, the only way that you can... Uh, make that even look like it's justified is by making up lies and by denying the obvious reality, the obvious reality that the Muslim world is finally standing up to the West, outsmarting the West, outmaneuvering the West, and building real pan-Islamic solidarity and solidarity across the global South. You know, you act like you want a revolution while there's a revolution taking place already. There's already a revolution, a liberation struggle taking place across the Muslim world, an anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist revolution is taking place and it's winning and it's building a new paradigm of global power dynamics. But you, you want to undermine all of that because it's not the kind of revolution that you imagine, you know, or it's, or it, it's not being led by who you th would like it to be led by. And because for some reason, you're just so emotionally invested in thinking that unity is impossible among Muslims that political independence is impossible, that economic sovereignty is impossible, and that the rulers in the Muslim world just must be under the yoke of the Americans. Or you're like a slave who tries to quell a slave revolt, and who tells everyone on the plantation that anyone who escapes from the plantation uh, gets immediately eaten by wolves. Well, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're that kind of slave that the master uses to keep the other slaves in line when his whip is broken. You see what you want to see, and you hear what you want to hear. Because the unity is plain to see. The solidarity is plain to see. The actions are all being taken right out in the open. And the West is getting cornered. And for some reason, you're choosing to be right there in the corner with them. Telling them and telling yourselves that none of this is really happening. But it is happening. And everyone in the world can see it. But it's not what you want to see, so you're blind to it. So when you talk about Arab and Muslim disunity, that's what you want to be true. And when you talk about the Arab and Muslim rulers doing nothing, you want that to be true. When you talk about the Arab and the Muslim countries abandoning Palestine, that's what you want them to do. Because you're so Western and so colonized. They want you uh, to want war. They want you to want escalation. Because war and escalation would actually... Uh, it's the only thing, in fact, that could resuscitate the dying beast of Zionism and colonization, and it would destroy uh, everything that the Muslim world and that BRICS is building now. War and escalation is the only game that America knows how to play. And the Global South and the Muslim countries are outplaying them in the game of politics and diplomacy and economics and international relations. So they want you to want war and to tell us that war is the only good and virtuous and meaningful action that can be taken over Gaza. And that if our countries don't go to war, then we should go to war against our own countries. Some sort of a civil war or rebellion or what have you. And that is so obviously the dream scenario of the colonizers and the Zionists. And again, I've said many times, I don't necessarily believe that any of these Muslim rulers are doing what they're doing uh, out of the goodness of their hearts out of love for Palestine, or even out of love for Islam. They're doing it because it makes sense. They're doing it because it suits their ambition, their desire for power, and their desire for influence, for their egos, what have you. And I don't care. Practically, it helps the Muslims. It helps the Palestinians. It's better for the region. And what they build will be inherited by future generations who may be better than them. At the end of the day, uh, it means the end of Zionism, the end of American and Western colonization, Western empire, and the securing of greater sovereignty and more independence for our people. And if you're opposed to that, 
then we all know whose side you're on. And it isn't the side of the Muslims, and it's the side that's going to lose.